Hello, and welcome to today's episode of our Southwestern Food Series show. I am Don Seymour, AARP volunteer for the AARP Arizona State Office. AARP is focused on the topic of reclaiming your health as the nation emerges from more than a year under the COVID-19 pandemic. You can go to aarp.org slash healthy living for tips, tools, and resources that can help you reclaim your health. Today, put on your aprons and join Tucson's food heroes, live from the comfort of your own kitchen. AARP Arizona, Southern Arizona Arts and Cultural Alliance, and Slow Food Southern Arizona are proud to present a four-part virtual culinary class. You can view all episodes at the AARP Arizona YouTube channel and see upcoming events at the AARP Virtual Community Center. If you have ever been curious about how to make a delicious tamale, now is the time. Chefs Christine Jensen and Christopher Baldwin of Gallery of Food Bodega will walk you through tamale making. A holiday tradition for many, tamales are a delicious year-round treat rich in tradition and flavor. In this class, you'll learn how to make your own masa. Don't worry, it's much easier than you think. With a myriad of fillings fit for meat lovers and vegetarians alike. These delicious treasure-wrapped corn husk jackets will be something enjoyed by family and friends year after year. Let's dig into this delicious session. Today we're gonna do duck tamales and we're gonna start uh, with slow roasting the duck. And today we don't have duck, we actually have chicken, but you can use chicken, duck, any kind of beef, any kind of meat that you could slow roast and shred. Pork would also work. Um, and we're gonna make it uh, not too spicy, but again, you can put some spicier chilies in there if you'd like. So we have, today we have uh, Guajillo chilies and Pasilla Negro chilies, which are both pretty mild chilies. So we're gonna leave a little bit of the seeds in it, just to add a little spice. If you want it super spicy, you can also use uh, chilies de arboles. And those are the little tiny, these are the chili de arbol. And those are super spicy. And where can we find these peppers, Chris? Uh, so you can get them, uh, I, we get ours through Mount Hope, but you can get a lot of really great chilies through Native Seed Search. We also use citrus. I like to make, it adds a little bit of pep to our uh, ingredients. So we actually use the whole citrus and I like to use orange. It's a little sweeter, so it makes the filling a little richer. But you could use lemons, tangerines. I would not use grapefruit because their peel's really bitter. We're gonna put most of this stuff on the bottom. So when you get a, a locally grown uh, turkey, the, uh, poultry, this is chicken from Top Knot Farms. We get our duck from Top Knot Farms. When you use something like that that's raised like you would if you raised it in your own backyard, there's not a lot of liquid in it. So we're gonna put the, the stuff on the bottom, put the chicken or the duck on top of it and really slow roast it, slow, really roast it slowly and we may put a little splash of water in there too because there's not gonna be a lot of liquid in there. If you get a commercial uh, chicken or a commercial duck, it's gonna have a lot more liquid in it, so you won't have to do, worry about that. We're gonna stick it in a, about a 275 degree oven for about four hours and just let it uh, cook and simmer. Um, and hopefully at the end of four hours, when you pull it out, it'll just fall off the bone and um, you'll be ready to go. And then all this stuff, we're gonna blend all this stuff up and make it like a sauce out of it, basically, to mix in with the shredded poultry. So we'll do, uh, uh, at the end, we'll pull the duck out. We're gonna take all of the goodies that are at the bottom, the liquid, the whole orange, the onion, the garlic, the chilies, and we're gonna put it in a blender and make a thick, juicy muck with it. I call it uh, juju. Uh, I grew up a little bit north of us in Santa Fe, and every holiday season, um, uh, my family didn't, but all of my friends' families had tamales out for the holidays. So on Christmas Eve, we would go out, uh, visit friends' houses, and uh, eat tamales. And that is my association with the holidays, tamales and bizcochitos. And he's putting that on there because we're going to put foil. Actually, we're going to put a piece of pa parchment paper uh, down any kind of piece of paper 
just to keep the foil from being directly on top of the poultry. Um, and then we're gonna wrap it really tight in, in aluminum foil. And then we're going to uh, even cover that with a little plastic shrink wrap to kind of seal it in. And you probably don't wanna use the plastic shrink wrap at your house. We use a commercial grade that holds up to higher temperatures. Um, but that'll, I just mostly I'm trying to keep all of the moisture inside this pan. This is ready to go. We're going to stick this in a, a 275 to 300 degree oven, and it'll probably take about four hours. So I would, in about three and a half hours, maybe pull it out, check it, see if it's falling off the bone and totally done. If it's not, throw it in for another hour or so. If it's done, you can cool it. I mean, if it's ready to go, if you had two forks, you could just go zhut, 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 and it'll just start shredding in your hands. When it's ready, yep. yeah. So we're gonna put that in the oven. You can cook it in a variety of fashions. You could cook it in a slow cooker or a pressure cooker. Um, Not a pressure cooker. You could, you could cook it in a pressure cooker. You can set those to an hour. Um, a lot of them come along with cookbooks that'll tell you how to get to a shreddable state. Um, and really the goal is to keep all the fluids inside to make sure it's tightly wrapped and we don't lose any liquids and that the chicken by the end, or poultry by the end, is easily shreddable with a couple of forks. The main object is to get it shreddable, so it may take a varying amount of time in your own, whatever method you use or whatever oven you use, it'll take a varying amount of time. So this is the finished product. We took our duck, roasted it, pureed all of the ingredients that were roasted with it, and added it back into the duck and we end up with a kind of a thick but soupy. And if it isn't that wet when we're done roasting the poultry, what could we add to it to make it this kind of moist? I would add a little stock to it just to make it uh, a little bit more gooey. If you want some other ideas for the fillings, we often use a sausage and this is e &R pork, which is a local uh, pork farm and this is their sausage and we have put some chili chipotles in this so this one is actually going to be a really spicy filling um, but there's a million fillings that you can use for tamales the, the corn and the masa is just a vehicle to get something really delicious uh, to you after you've gotten your duck shredded the next thing you want to do is soak your corn husks and I always use a lot of corn husks because I'm never confident that I'm gonna have exactly what I need. So I throw a lot of uh, corn husks in a container in hot water and soak them for about 20, 30 minutes so that I have plenty of very pliable pieces of corn husk. And I get my corn husks at Food City. Uh, you can get them pr here in Tucson. You can pretty much get them at any grocery store that you want. Um, almost everybody's got them, but just make plenty because you don't want to be at the end and be short. Um, and you can always dry them out and reuse them. So we have our wet corn husks here and we have our filling and then the next step is going to be making the masa. I think the most interesting part of tamales for me is the corn. And there's a huge variety of corns that are native to all over the Southwest. And when I first started exploring this, um, I wanted to experiment with blue corn and red corn. And one of the interesting things I discovered is that the corns that have the color all the way through them are all high altitude corn. So if you're getting corn here in the Sonoran Desert, um, you're not going to find the blue corn that stays true to color all the way through. It's gonna be a colored corn like this. This is a, a Toona Odom red corn. And then when you cook it, it loses its shell and it's a white corn. And then this is a yellow uh, Pima, Pima number 10, I think it, she called it. So this is to me the secret of a tamale is choosing your corn 
and having it be super flavorful. So when you're making the masa from dried corn, you need to soak the corn for quite a while. We usually soak our corn for about two weeks before we start using it. Um, so this is corn that's been soaked and when you soak it, you're gonna soak it in with lime and the lime helps digest some of the um, some of the corn and make it more usable and actually more uh, more digestible to you as well. So we soak it, we cook it with the lime and then soak it for about two weeks. And then we rinse it and rinse it and rinse it really thoroughly so that you, you get all the lime off of it. And then it's at this point here where we're ready to grind it. This grinder is, um, I found this in Mexico. It's very difficult to find a grinder that will grind wet corn uh, here in this country. Um, so I do enough of it that it really helped us. If you're just doing it in your home, I highly recommend just a food processor. It works really well. Um, but this is uh, my fun toy that I really enjoy using. So this is our food grinder, that our corn grinder that we're gonna grind to get the masa. So this food grinder just takes the masa and makes it just this soft, kind of sticky consistency. And when we goop it all together, you should end up, it's a little, this is a little dry. I would add a little moisture to it, but you have a nice pliable ball of masa. We're going to start with this pig fat from e &R Pork. They saved it for us and we are gonna render this. And you can render it in a lot of different ways, but the most important part of this is that you do it really slowly. Uh, you wanna melt all of the fat away from any solids that are there without burning it. Um, we do it in the oven, but it, we also do it in really large quantities. So you can also do it a little bit more quickly on your stove top. Um, but you wanna do it super slowly um, so that you don't have burned pieces in your lard. And then you pour off all the fat and get rid of whatever solids are left. And there'll be like little hunks of things left, but you should have almost exclusively a nice crystal clear oil that's left. And then we stick it in the refrigerator. And then this is what we end up with. If you see it in the grocery stores, it's Snow White. It's actually called Snow Cap. And if you make it from your own fat, you're gonna have a lot of flavor off of this. And I can actually smell it from here. So um, to me, this is really worth doing. It's not too complicated, it's just time consuming. And you end up with a product that you can actually add a lot of flavor to your tamales. Once you've made the uh, home rendered lard, it has a nearly indefinite shelf life. Unless you cross contaminate into it, it could sit in your refrigerator for months. Mm -hmm. And when I'm making the tamales, I often have a little bit of bacon fat left from cooking off bacon. And that also works really well uh, in the tamales. So sometimes I'll, I'll do half lard and half bacon fat. So the first step with the making the masa for the tamales is to whip your lard. And so we're gonna start with the lard that we rendered. This is a little soupy because we uh, have had it out of the fridge for a while, but it doesn't matter. You can do this in different uh, places. You could do this in a food processor, but a stand-up mixer does a much better job of it. At home, I actually very often have used a hand mixer and just held it until it was really fluffy. But this is the important step to make sure that it is completely fluffy and it'll triple in size almost. Um, and there's a test you can do, which we'll show you in a moment, uh, where you float it in water. And if it floats, then the moss is about ready to go. So we're gonna turn this on high and we're gonna leave it five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
So it looks done. It's almost tripled in size. It has nice peaks. There's some test. There's a test you can use to see if it's in the right place. It's very simple. We have a glass of water, cold water. Cold water. We're gonna take just a little blob of the masa, and when, if it floats, it's aerated enough. If you don't get it aerated enough, your tamale will it, it tend to be kind of hard and rubbery. So our next step is going to be adding the masa and the salt and the baking powder. And this, you can see this is crumbly and not very wet. And the amount of liquid you're going to add later is completely dependent upon how wet your masa is to start with. So that's going to be kind of an eyeballed amount. So we're going to add our masa and I'm kind of crumbling it as I add it so it doesn't uh, so it mixes a little easier. And then I'm going to sprinkle the salt and the baking powder. And the baking powder helps fluff it a little bit too. And then now I'm going to use the paddle attachment. And if you don't have a mixer, this is when you're going to just sort of start folding it in with a wooden spoon would probably be a good choice. So I think this is pretty good. So this is a pretty good consistency. So I might change the stock based on what the filling is. We're using chicken stock, but if I had a shredded beef, I might use beef stock. Mm -hmm. If I had a vegetarian instead of lard, I would use uh, Crisco and I would use a veg vegetable stock. Yeah, and you can also use coconut oil coconut if you're really, oil. if you, but it's That's a little true. tricky with the temperatures on the coconut you oil. You can change the stock based on what the filling is going to be. And I always taste it at this point. Masa has a tendency to suck up a lot of salt and a lot of flavor. And so you do want a flavorful stock or you need to add more salt to make it delicious. That's delicious. Okay. That's worth noting that while we're making our own masa, and that's the whole point of this operation, that you can actually buy masa in either a wet bag or in a powder form. And then you follow instructions to go from there. But this is the best flavorful corn that we can get. But if you had to, you could buy wet masa at a supermarket and follow a lot of these instructions from that point. From, uh, you need to add the salt and the stock to give it flavor. But from adding the salt and the stock and the baking powder, I mean, the, you can start with the wet masa from a store and then add the rest of these ingredients as we did. So we're ready to start making the tamales and we have our corn husks our prepped masa ready to go and our filling which is the shredded duck filling um as i do this i was i did not grow up making these so i don't have uh the super quick technique but uh out of a love of making them i've figured out how to do it so you may have seen somebody do it a lot more proficiently than i so we're going to start with the husks and Sometimes if I have a lot of them, I can be a little picky about which ones I pick. And if you don't have a lot of them, sometimes you have to kind of piece them together. But right now we're going to start with some nice big pieces. And these are ideal. Actually right here. And we're going to put the masa down first. And how much masa you put in here is really not important. Um, you can make them tiny, you can make them large, and I like to make them large because I'm impatient and I love the filling, so I make them on the big side. And the proportion of filling to masa is also a personal choice. I do about two parts of masa to one part of uh, duck, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe two-thirds. Um, but you can do that you, to taste. You can throw, one thing I love to throw in here um, are pickled jalapenos. So I like to put the filling down and put a little pickled jalapeno in there. Um, but when I'm selling them at our bodega, I don't do that because a lot of people don't like super spicy stuff and you can always add spice later. 
So we have scoops to make it quick and easy, but you can just use a spoon and eyeball it if you want. Um, and I put a big blob of masa here and I use the scoop actually to kind of make it a little bit oblong. And I leave it up toward the top uh, so that we have room to fold the husk of the tamale. And I'm gonna put a generous amount of filling down and sort of tuck it right into that masa. You know, it's worth noting that masa just means dough, right? So this is harima masa. And then you wrap it nice and tight and fold it. And then I kind of give it a little tap and you have a nice tamale. And if you're, again, if you want to be fancy and you're not making hundreds of them, you can get a little strip of the of a husk, whoops, and tie this down with a little knot. I'm not that patient, so I don't normally do this. Well, we, we often make hundreds. So, and my fingers are not so. as, whoop. <laughs> So not as dexterous as they used to be. Making tamales is a family affair. The whole idea is to invite a bunch of your friends and relatives over for a yep. tamale party. And while somebody is making the dough, somebody else is making the filling, <laughs> and then everybody stands around in the kitchen yeah. folding and packing tamales together. The, the idea, the fun idea is to ha have guests when they come over, bring their own filling. And then they can fill their tamales with whatever it is they like. And at the end of the day, they bring home a dozen tamales. And you keep a many dozen tamales. I've made as many as 14 dozen in a single night with a bunch of friends. So a tamale party is a good, is, is a good time. And you wanna get it nice and tight. And this, will make about, give or, depends on how big you make them, but give or take 10 to 12 really nice sized tamales. When you are using a double piece of corn husk, you wanna overlap them very thoroughly. You don't wanna have them be real tight uh, so that you can pull a little bit and not end up pulling them apart. So there you go. So we're ready to steam these, and you can do this in a variety of ways too. The most common is to put them in a pot covered uh, and steam them stovetop. When we do hundreds of them, I don't have a big uh, stove big enough to do that, so we'll put them in the oven. But regardless of how you do it, the object is to get them in a really moist environment, we have for this, uh, because we're doing a small batch, I have a small stock pot and I didn't have a screen or anything to put down there. So I put a metal plate. You wanna put something that's uh, not gonna crack or break if, with, it, with heat on it. So I put a plate in there that's metal. And then I put water so that it's just maybe, oh, about, an eighth of an inch over the top of it so that they're sitting in a teeny amount of water but the water's not going to soak up and get into the tamales because we're going to put them in upright like this. We made 11 tamales and we are probably not going to fill this completely so they'll kind of toss and uh, tip over in there. So we're going to put something else that's also heat proof in here to take up some of that space so that they'll sit nice and tall. So we're gonna load these up. And you also want a, something that's taller than the tamales because you're gonna cover them and you want them, the tops to get the steam. I want two of those. So we've got our tamales loaded and we're going to seal them up and I'm going to put the lid on it and then I'm also going to wrap it in foil 
uh, so that none of the air escapes. So when it gets hot, it doesn't do this and let steam out. I want to get them really tight. Um, and then we're going to put them on the stove, uh, low simmering heat, and how long? Uh, hour? An hour. At least an hour. Depends how many tamales are in the pot. So I have a very large tamale steamer at home, and it can take as long as two hours. But I think this size is one hour. And when we do it in the oven, I do it at 275 degrees, and I do it for usually about two and a half to three hours. Um, again, depending on how, how much I have. Sometimes it even takes as long as four hours if I've got lots of pots with them in there. Once they are steamy and fluffy and the masa doesn't have that real uh, doughy feel to it, we are ready to eat. They look delicious. And this is my absolute favorite Chimayo red chili sauce. Something for another time. This is a very nice texture for it. It's fluffy. All right. Ooh, delicious. Careful. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, hope you have success with your tamales. Have a good holiday and join us at our store, Gallery of Food Bodega on Fort Lowell and Tucson Boulevard.